I don't know if Kevin's still in the room, but we're going to probably show our hand a little bit uh, and, and being a little bit off from that vision uh, here in Michigan, but certainly having given you all a sense of how we're looking at the regs that he mentioned and some of the other uh, projects that we have going on, like SIM in Michigan, and how we're using those to propel uh, quality improvement uh, in our Medicaid program forward and making it a, a priority. Um, I was actually going to start by saying who I was and why Monica's here and what she's going to sort of kick off with, um, but it sounds like Rick already did that. So um, I am going to turn it over to Monica. She's going to sort of lay uh, a framework and a foundation, a high level perspective uh, for us first, and then I'm going to come in and talk about specifically what Michigan is doing to try to respond to some of the, some of the new regulations and other vehicles that we have out there um, as it relates to quality measurement and quality improvement. So. Hi, everyone. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here with you this Friday afternoon. Everyone looks so perky right now. <laughs> like Tom said, um, I used to be in the role of Quality Improvement Director for Michigan Medicaid, um, a role that Tom just stepped into a few months ago. Um, I now work for Health Management Associates, uh, which is why you'll see our uh, both of our logos on these slides, so um, I could get to continue doing this same kind of work in this general, general space. Um, let's see if I can do this correctly. All right, so we're just going to go over um, some key topics this afternoon, a basic overview of the quality regulatory environment that Michigan Medicaid programs need to operate in. Um, some of the key things that CMS is driving at um, in the new regs. Um, one of those is a, is a quality strategy, rather unlike the quality strategies we're used to. Um, and then Tom's gonna finish up with just exactly how Michigan is gonna pull off all of these things that, uh, that, they, that they will need to do um, in the future. All right, so state Medicaid agencies have a lot of people telling them what to do. Um, they are beholden to a lot of uh, different rules and regs, um, including state legislative and departmental priorities. Um, so like, like Sue Moran from Public Health said, when there are things identified in the state as a specific issue, um, those things rise to the top and where Medicaid um, needs to take a role, um, they will do so. Um, the legislature um, also tends to direct some activities of the Medicaid program. Um, you'll see it in boilerplate, you'll see it in, you know, the Healthy Michigan Plan, um, uh, the Medicaid expansion uh, legislation um, for Michigan back in 2014. Uh, not only expanded Medicaid in Michigan, they had a couple of really specific things they wanted done. Um, so, uh, so the, the state itself has directions it wants to go, and the Medicaid program can, plays a key role in those. There are also waivers, uh, sort of pilots, demonstrations, um, in, you know, large grants that states get. They all have their own sets of, uh, of either quality measures or framework for reporting. Some of them have very specific things, um, but uh, those, those have to, um, those need to get done along with the other, um, the other requirements as well. So if a state has a specific waiver, um, SIM, for example, um, is, is a, a um, project that, that doesn't have specific measures required by CMS, but it has to have measures. Um, so the different states are, um, they are sele have selected their own quality measures. They may or may not align. Um, but they uh, typically waivers and demonstrations have their own sets of measures. Um, but primarily in the regulatory landscape for Medicaid programs and especially managed care programs uh, are the CMS regs. Um, they were originally established in 2002 um, and just had a major upgrade. Um, frankly, I think Michigan, Sue, can you remind, I think Michigan began its managed care program in 97? I don't know what it looked like between 97 and 2002 when there, when there were no managed care rules, um, but, uh, but we certainly know what they look like now. Um, and there are 
a number of significant changes in the quality realm um, as it pertains to those new CMS regs. So generally what you'll see in the regs, not only in quality, but across, uh, across the regs, um, is an attempt from CMS um, to align across states, across programs, and certainly across plans. Now there's a lot, um, there's not a ton of variation in requirements across plans unless they're serving different populations, um, but CMS is, I think, uh, <laughs> Dr. Larson can correct me if I'm wrong, probably done their, of looking at five different quality strategies for the same state. They really want to see what's happening in Michigan in a, in a cohesive and concise way. Um, so consistency across um, the states get some uh, considerable flexibility in what they measure, in how they measure it, but you've gotta be measuring. You know, something like network adequacy. Uh, CMS has a couple of hard and fast rules about which docs need to be where in relation to the population, um, but CMS is not telling state Medicaid programs how many pediatric cardiologists they need. The states decide on some of those specific things, and then CMS says you have to demonstrate to us that you are holding your plans accountable for doing that. So that the intent is um, alignment in what is being addressed, and then a transparent, consistent reporting mechanism. Um, part of that is a lot more uh, putting things on websites and public comment periods for the quality strategy for the quality rating system if a state wants to do its own. Um, accreditation was always required in Michigan for Medicaid health plans, but we didn't post it online necessarily. Um, and Tom and his friends in the QIPD at Michigan Medicaid will now be posting accreditation information. I think it's next month, so let's get on that. <laughs> All right, so this is the, the, a bit of a messy slide, but we'll spend a few minutes on it. So the comprehensive quality strategy, and I say comprehensive, there really should be an asterisk by it. Um, CMS originally wanted to include the fee-for-service Medicaid population in the comprehensive part of the comprehensive quality strategy. Um, state Medicaid agencies were not very excited about that. Um, it, is, it is difficult to manage quality in the fee-for-service world, especially in a state with Michigan where so much of your fee-for-service population is either on their way into a managed care plan um, or they're, maybe they're voluntary and they chose to be in fee-for-service um, and where most of your provider network is serving fee-for-service but also serving managed care folks as well. Um, so we use comprehensive to mean all of the different types of managed entities in Michigan. So typically when you talk about Medicaid managed care, you're, um, at least in the Michigan environment, where medical is split off from behavioral and substance use, and um, you're talking about the Medicaid MCOs. Um, they have uh, their own sets of, of regs specific to them. There's a contract specific to the MCOs. Um, their own measures, their own standards, that program still needs to run in and of itself. Um, the integrated care organizations or the uh, My Health Link demo has its own set of measures, its own set of rules that it has to follow. Um, we're not saying that any of that needs to be diminished in any way. The, the same thing with the PIHPs and the My Choice waiver agents, which are also managed care entities. Um, right now, there's one dental vendor that is considered a PAP. Um, there's an RFP out right now. It's in the middle of a bid. Um, so there may or may not be more dental vendors that are also managed care entities that need to be included in the state's quality strategy. So this one document that CMS can look at and get a good sense of what's happening with Medicaid dollars for all of the populations across all of the programs in all of the plans. And Tom is going to tell you how they're going to pull it off. <laughs> Thanks, Monica. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to go over sort of some of the rule implementation, uh, really give you a sense of, 
of how we're looking at uh, getting that started and then really focus on three specific examples. Uh, I think that uh, what I hope to do is actually link those three specific examples into uh, what what I believe and what I think Monica and others uh, would believe is one of the more critical rules that we need to implement and that is that comprehensive quality strategy. Um, it, it, Monica said that our, our managed care program has been around for 20 years and so what we what we found when the regulations were first released is that we were a little ahead of we were ahead of the game. Uh, we had we we had already achieved or we were in compliance with many of the regulations. There were some minor things that we needed to post to a website and some some language we needed to add to our external quality review organization contract. Those sorts of things. But um, really, one of the one of the main uh, uh, regulations that I focus on now in my new role is the comprehensive quality strategy. Um, and you know, Kevin, you can plug your ears, uh, we can certainly write a very good comprehensive quality strategy uh, for Michigan, um, but what we really want to make sure we're doing is implementing a, a very robust quality uh, strategy for Michigan. Uh, and it does get a little bit complicated because we have different quality sections or divisions or units or uh, call it what you want to call it across multiple administrations uh, in the department, so there's different owners of quality across all of the programs that, that Monica was talking about. So uh, we are a department that's familiar with collaboration, uh, but it does get uh, challenging when you have multiple administrations with different stakeholder sets and different priorities and accountability structures uh, to make sure a quality strategy is not just uh, sounding good on paper. So. Um, that leads into the next three that I'll talk about, um, and really our idea of creating some some vehicles, some forums, some forums to roll up into a structure uh, that that all of these different uh, quality units can start plugging into. Uh, so the first one, uh, we're actually uh, working, going to be working closely with HMA and looking at the regulations across all of our different administrations. So that's not just the managed care area, but also the behavioral health administration, uh, the long-term care uh, services and supports area, uh, the, the uh, children's with spe uh, special health care needs, um, CSHCS populations. So multiple populations with different measurement and quality strategies that we need to engage and bring into this effort. And we're going to be working with HMA to understand what the regulations ask for, the timelines associated with those regulations, uh, and bringing all the, the internal stakeholders, if you will, together to understand that timeline, implement that timeline, and then actually communicate out into our other, with our other stakeholders, such as the, the Medicaid health plans who, um, and the ICOs and the, and the prepaid inpatient health plans, all of our contractors, essentially, that, that are really critical in making sure this work gets done. Um, I want to spend some time here on the data validation, data vetting, Julia, they've probably heard three different names for this group, um, but essentially what we're, what we're looking to do is create a forum, at least within the managed physical health, managed care um, space, uh, to work closely with our contracted health plans on vetting measures. Uh, and so, um, Julia or Monica, you may you keep me honest here, but uh, I think Part of this came about because we, uh, we as a department, uh, with our health plan, started looking at measures such as uh, preterm, was it preterm birth? There was a preterm birth measure. There's a uh, lead screening measure. So some of these measures that we were starting to collect from our data warehouse, put into our um, performance monitoring reports that we, that we publish. And when I say publish, I mean we publish to the, to the plans. Uh, about how they're how they're uh, performing on these different measures uh, specified, uh, but the preterm labor was one um, measure that was that was being published, and the plan said, "Well, that doesn't look exactly right. Uh, can we see your uh, data at a beneficiary level and start bumping it against the the information we have?" Uh, and they did that, and the rates were drastically different. Uh, and so the department ended up rolling out some record reviews across the state and found out, wow, yeah, the, the rate is quite different, so let's, let's put that on hold. Uh, lead screening is another measure that um, we were publishing in our performance monitoring report and the plan said that's not exactly aligning with what our records are showing. Um, so we internally did some, some investigation and found there was uh, some data inconsistencies on the state side. Um, 
Another example um, is the follow-up after hospitalization uh, for mental illness within 30 days. That's another measure we're, we're starting to publish out to plans, uh, and they're wanting to know that beneficiary level data of who's in the numerator, who's in the denominator. Let me take a look uh, at what we have. So, you know, the, the, the process itself was starting to roll out. Um, the challenge was different plans sometimes had different priorities of measurement uh, at different points in time. Uh, and so but one thing we wanted to do was create an organized central way to go about uh, in collaboration with our plans, setting priorities for what measures do we want to look at, uh, what measures do we want to provide you data for, and then validate. Uh, really the goal here being we need to make sure that the data within our Medicaid data warehouse is, is credible for, for building performance measures uh, for our plans and how they're performing. Um, so making sure the plans agree with what we're publishing uh, in our alignment, uh, and maybe the queries need to be changed, maybe you know parameters of the specification of the me measure need to be revisited. Uh, so we're open to all of those, uh, but the goal here is to make sure that the data warehouse is a high quality place to start measuring the performance of the plans because that's why it's there. I mean, one of the reasons that it's there is to monitor the performance of our plans. So. That's one of the reasons for this, this work group. Uh, the other sort of future looking uh, point of this work group is that once we, once we are starting to gain some confidence within the data with, that's in our warehouse, uh, we do want to work with our plans to look at what other measures, what, what else can we be measuring um, beyond the HEDA specified measures that are really, a, helping, um, making sure we are painting a good picture about the performance that, that you're, you're, you're having with your provider networks. So we're not limiting ourselves to necessarily those heat specified measures. But we know that takes time, right? We know that we all have to be on the same page of what, what are we measuring, how are we measuring it, what data are we using, uh, and then is it reliable and valid as it relates to the, the information that the plans have. So this creates that forum, that collaborative spirit, if you will, uh, with our plans. Uh, to start looking at, th at measures beyond HEDIS that we're making sure we're painting a good picture of what our health plans are doing and, and what kind of care uh, our beneficiaries are, are experiencing as well. Um, the next group I want to talk about is our um, advanced payment or alternative payment model uh, work group, and I actually see some people in the audience that, that are on this work group. Uh, essentially what we're doing here, and I don't know, I believe macro was covered earlier today. Is that true, basically? Um, so essentially, um, so you must know that there's Medicare incentives on the table from a provider standpoint to start moving away from fee-for-service and into these advanced payment models that, that the macro rules are defining. So what we've done actually um, in Medicaid in partnership with our state innovation model group is come up with an APM strategy with, with our Medicaid health plans. Uh, we are looking at the healthcare payment learning and action network framework, which I believe actually just underwent some uh, revisions about a month ago or so. Um, but we're looking at that framework, that category one fee for service to over to category four capitation sort of uh, continuum. Uh, and we're working with our health plans, uh, I think monthly it's been since March, uh, to uh, collect uh, medical expenditure information along that continuum, uh, refining what the numerator and denominator definitions are, what's, what expenditures are included and excluded in numerator and denominator, so we can start to formulate a baseline of their performance, if you will, uh, in paying in these different types of ways beyond fee-for-service. We're getting pretty close, I think, to having a somewhat of a uniform, consistent uh, way to start measuring, at least uh, a jumping off point. Um, I do expect that to evolve and be refined over time. Um, but with that baseline set, we are going to be looking for plans to submit, I think, within the next month and a half or so, a three-year strategic plan for uh, the department to review and, and evaluate and approve. Uh, that will say, based on our baseline, uh, our projections or our targets in these advanced uh, methods of payment are going to be, and the plans would propose their targets, uh, and here's how we're going to achieve those 
targets. Um, they would propose specific models um, and the um, department would evaluate the plan's performance in moving away from fee-for-service uh, based on their own plan, essentially. Um, we do have at the state um, compliance review, corrective action type um, opportunities with plans to um, evaluate and, and tell them to revise or, or, or do things a little differently. Uh, and we also, ha also have the capitation withhold uh, that we can start assigning um, incentive dollars to meeting those targets. But uh, we don't expect to use the withhold f this year. Um, we do want to make sure that our measurement uh, from an expenditure standpoint along the categories is, is consistent and uniform. Um, that's very important when we start to assign incentive dollars to their performance. So. Just a little bit more about the APM group. Um, you know, I, I just want to emphasize again that it's been a collaborative process with our plans. Uh, we do recognize that there's plans of different sizes in different geographies across our state, and so uh, plan performance, as as with anything, uh, is not entirely up to the plan itself. Um, so provider capacity within the regions that they that they uh, serve uh, comes into play. Uh, and then how many members they have really um, impacts their ability to move into or not um, higher risk-based type, type arrangements. So we've been working, uh, I would say, pretty well. Uh, the plans have been very collaborative with us uh, in trying to define this strategy and sort of build the plane slowly as we just sort of move towards taking off. Um, the other thing I think it's doing, uh, that I see it doing, is we are looking at sort of preferred models, if you will, quote unquote, um, to count into this APM framework. And so some of the, some of the models that have come up are the patient-centered medical home payment model, um, uh, primary care subcapitation is one, and then um, certainly behavior health, physical health integration. Now these are not required models, uh, or required concepts even. Uh, that plans would have to implement, but uh, we are looking at that burden piece and trying to create alignment where we can and incentivize plans where we can to use these preferred models. And really what that's doing, I think, uh, is unifying us with the plans so that we're coming out into the provider community on a, on a more unified front and saying, here's the models that are important to us. Let's see what we can do together. Um, otherwise, it makes provider engagement that much harder when, when we're not on the same page uh, with, our, with our Medicaid health plans. Uh, the other thing that's come up uh, is related to quality measurement. So um, in order to count as an APM, in our, in not only in our, our framework, but in the healthcare payment learning and action network framework and in, in, in MACRA as well, uh, these the new payment models have to be linked to quality and so the plans pretty quickly fairly quickly uh, started saying well, we need to have some standard quality measures that we can start um, aligning with so that we're not pushing out um, all different quality measures in the same geography maybe even with the same provider or the same network um, so they've been asking us for that uh, and we're, we're looking into it. Uh, we, we decided to start with the set of quality measures that we already incentivized them for, so we didn't, we didn't not want to kick off a brand new program and start inserting brand new measures into this, this framework. Uh, so we are building off of the measures we already have in our incentive programs. Uh, but we're taking a little bit different approach to that, so we're looking at it from a regional variance perspective. Um, so typically when we measure plan performance, it's just that, it's plan performance. Uh, and some plans are all over the lower peninsula and some are in one region and some are in three regions. Um, but they all roll up to plan performance. Um, so we're looking at these quality measures from a regional perspective and seeing if there's variance across regions regardless of if three plans or five plans are, are performing well at it, if, if overall um, that measure is low performing in that region. We want to look at how we can really, and this is the last bullet, how we can use payment form as a quality improvement vehicle. Um, and that tends to be the conversation, at least the circles I'm in, which you can imagine the circles I'm in uh, because of my role. Uh, we always talk about payment reform as a quality improvement tool. Um, it's, not it's not a cost cutting 
cost avoidance, that sort of tool. And I don't even think we, that comes up necessarily with the plans either. Um, we are really looking at how can we leverage payment reform to improve quality. Um, our plans, quite frankly, do a pretty good job at managing costs. That's one reason why we went to managed care. Um, but uh, d depending on how uh, federal uh, uh, strategies shake out, you know, we may, we may get Medicaid funding in a different way and we may have to start looking at, uh, we may have to really prioritize cost management um, in this context, but um, we sort of have a vehicle for cost management and this is, um, we are looking at payment reform as a, as a QI tool. Um, finally, and I have no idea about time, am I doing all right? All right. Uh, so finally, I want to talk about the state innovation model quality measures. Uh, our state did receive a, I don't know if Sims come, I'm sure it's come up, but I don't know if the, oh, all right. Um, we were, uh, we received a SIM grant, four-year SIM grant in 2015. Um, we've received just a couple, no cost extensions, so I think we're in a, a 24 month year two. Uh, um, but we are on good footing as it relates to quality measurement for sure. Um, we have a patient-centered medical home um, model that uh, started, I think, earlier this year, January of this year. Um, and it really uh, took a look at the uh, physician payer quality collaborative, the PPQC measures that I think you're about to hear, hear about in a second, uh, and bumped those up against some of the Medicaid managed care uh, incentive measures that we already use and created some alignment there. Um, so you'll hear Joe Neller talk about the MSMS effort to align commercial and Medicaid payers and provider organizations around quality measures. Um, so SIM uh, really adopted those, or it was kind of a partnership. I think they may have added just one or two um, to help us out, but um, we started with alignment with PPQC, uh, and now we're looking at the measure specifications of the SIM uh, quality measures uh, and trying to really move into a position where the, the measure specifications of the SIM quality measure set are the same as what Medicaid health plans use. Um, partly because the same providers are probably getting reports from our Medicaid health plans that are in different specs and probably different frequencies and um, we want to make sure that we're, we're not confusing our providers by throwing out two different measurements about the same, same population. So um, we do have a timeline over the next uh, maybe year or so to look to try to update that, that specification so that we have alignment from a specification standpoint uh, and as well as the, the conceptual measures being used. Uh, we do expect to increase the level of collaboration as it relates to these SIM quality measures uh, in the near term, Julie. Uh, so we'll, we'll start getting this in front of the QI directors of our plans pretty soon um, so that they understand what specs are being used, how they're being published to our, provide, their, our SIM PCMH providers, which are their providers, um, and, and creating some alignment. And we expect to get some feedback on that and make some modifications where it makes sense so that you know, we're, we're um, attending to any potential concerns you might have as it relates to your provider networks. Um, we are using data from our data warehouse for these measures. Um, uh, so you know, we continue to push the use of our data warehouse and we, that, that will continue. Um, they're, they're, that's what we expect to start using more and more as a performance measurement tool um, for our program. Um, and we have other sort of avenues of trying to improve the, the encounter, the, the data within that, that warehouse as well. So we're sort of trying to improve the quality of the encounter data that's in there and also start extracting it and using, for, using it for performance measurement. Um, Finally, the SIM evaluation, um, they, they are essentially the same measures as the PCMH measure set, but they do have slightly different uh, methodologies. And part of that, Sue, I think is because we, we did engage your group and looked at the SIM measures and we got some, some recommendations from our public health folks to make modifications so that they start looking at health disparities and other things that, 
that maybe the HEDIS specifications don't entirely capture. And so I'm thinking of the uh, breast cancer screening measure right now and the age limitation of when to include that um, and how that doesn't necessarily align with the recommendations of different subpopulations uh, with different, race, different races. So in summary, uh, you know, what, what I wanted to make sure people understood is that quality improvement is a priority of this department. And comprehensive, I, I like the word. It's the right word to do it the right way. Um, and it will, be, uh, it will be work to do that uh, because we have quality folks, um, a whole team of quality folks in behavioral health, and we have a whole team of quality folks in long-term care and in managed care and in children's with special health care needs, and we have these different pockets of operationalizing different Medicaid programs, and they have their own quality uh, team and their own quality measures and their own quality strategy, but um, really to do it right, we need to, we need to work together better uh, as a department. Um, and, and really, the regs help us do that. Um, the regulations and the state innovation model project, things like that help us, um, we, we can leverage those opportunities to, to put quality improvement as a priority in front of people's faces and, and move them in the direction to start working together um, and, and strategize together um, and actually implement a strategy together. Uh, and finally, I just want to sort of leave you with that same sort of collaboration um, aspect that this, that, that, that has to happen. Um, when we think about using a new measure to monitor our health plans, when we do it well, we're putting it in front of them a year probably before we move it into the capitation withhold. We don't always do it, uh, but when we do it well, that's what we're doing. We're, we're introducing the idea of the measure to them, and they usually have really good ideas. Um, they they all, always think of things that we don't, and so we get an idea in front of them, they help us formulate that idea, and then we're measuring it and we're putting it in front of them for about a year uh, before we start uh, moving it into some, some sort of incentive program or, or compliance program. Uh, so we really want to make sure that we're letting, helping the plans have time to wrestle with that measure and, and how it relates to their provider networks and help the provider networks understand the measure and, and wrestle with that. Um, so it is a time intensive and we really need to be thinking ahead all of the time uh, and working closely with, with our Medicaid health plans and helping them make our, um, our data set credible and reliable. So I th that is it. Um, that is, is my correct phone number. Um, and so we'll leave this up here and take time. Do we have time for questions? OK. Okay, that's better. All right, so Tom, um, I feel like I've been tagged on Facebook this afternoon. Um, the, I think the original reason for the data group was that um, the plans uh, collect lots of data that's not in the warehouse. So electronic medical record data, hybrid data, lots of data sources that aren't included in the state data warehouse. So that measure results produced out of that warehouse can never be as complete or robust what the plans produce for themselves. So after the NCQA presentation today, I guess my um, challenge or concern is how to keep the encounter data warehouse relevant. So as plans are working toward the um, ECDS measures, and we can include man uh, information from our case management files, uh, patient registries at provider offices, electronic health records, all of that will be part of our data that we use in those ECDS measures for NCQA. None of that, I mean, is there, will there be a way to include all of this data in the EDW if it's going to be used for all these purposes? So, well, it's future business for 
my hand, right? curious, I'm, oh, and I'm too close to the speaker, um, I'd be curious in Dr. Larson and, and or Ben's kind of perspective on this, if you're all right in answering kind of what your take is, you, you asked or no? Was that a no go away or too late because I'm right here? <laughs> Can you uh, reframe it for me again? No, no. Oh, at the, uh, yeah, so um, what I can say is that the, um, what we're hearing from our new administrator, so we were asked to put together a strategy. My team coordinates our strategy. Um, state flexibility is another one of the four of her goals. It's customer service, state flexibility, um, <clears throat> uh, providers and patients empowered to uh, make decisions on their own. and. Um, uh, so there's, there are two that are related but different. One is putting patients first and one is uh, CMS as uh, delivering high value customer service. So um, the, uh, what I anticipate is that we will continue down this uh, flexibility um, which gives you a lot of programmatic flexibility and a focus, continued focus then on quality outcomes and moving to understanding the uh, way that you're executing programs by the outcomes that you're achieving as opposed to, um, uh, I don't see from this administration, and this is just my guess, uh, uh, a really heavy focus on new regulation. In fact, you're hearing very clearly from them they want to focus on less regulation, and we're hearing clearly from uh, the administrator uh, on more state flexibility. Uh, but what she has said to us is that that flexibility comes with an, in, an enhanced focus then on outcomes and having a way to understand and be able to communicate across what kind of outcomes we're achieving with the sort of programmatic um, deregulation and flexibility that we're getting. So I don't know if that was what you're hoping for. Of course. That was exactly what I was hoping for. Um, ben, did you have anything else you wanted to add? No? Not at this time? All right. We're all kind of anxious to keep moving. All right. So thank you, uh, Monica and Tom.